3, verse 1 through 7. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at a time of prayer. At three in the afternoon, now, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to be from beg to those in the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting some expecting something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Acts three twelve. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as, as if by our own power of, or godliness we have made the man walk? We're continuing our series today, which is... Uh, Crossroads. It's talking about how there's times in our lives when we face decisions on which way to go, and uh, we've talked about how your past can be a roadblock. We've talked about how conflict can be a roadblock, and so today we're going to talk about and and look at when fear of risk is a roadblock, and really what we're going to look at is biblical reflections on the concept of risk. Are you good at taking risk? Some people are real risk takers. I mean, they will do all kinds of things that are dangerous. Don't think another thought about it. I watched um, a Netflix program about this guy that liked to climb cliffs, and he loved to do it without any ropes at all. He would free climb, and he had no fear. He even did it when it was icy. I mean, he was kind of you know, different about that, and it was actually very dangerous, and the sad part is he ended up killing himself not long after the show was videoed because he risked in that way, and so that's a negative part of facing fears with too much risk, but a lot of people are on the other side, that they are afraid of a lot of things, and um, I was looking at this online and looking at many... Um, people who have written about this, and there's this one girl who has uh, spoken about this and written about this. Her name is Michelle Poehler. I've got a picture of her, I think. I've got a couple of pictures. Um, and she is known for going through 100 days of fear in her life. i got a couple of pictures. She's a real s- small girl, and uh, she grew up afraid of a lot of things. And when she went to co- college, she was working actually on her master's degrees, at School of Visual Arts in New York City. And her professor asked her class to look deep in their souls and to plan out where they would want to be if they could not fail in two years. And that was part one of the process. The second part of the assignment was to think of all the possible things that would block you from achieving that goal. And when she started thinking about that, a lot of stuff brought up for her uh, the past she had been afraid of so many things. She was afraid of of tons of things. In fact, when she was a little girl, she was afraid of dogs, and her uncle got a new big dog. And when he did that, she was always afraid to go over to his house. She passed on a backpacking trip when she graduated high school with her friends because she was afraid to stay in a hostel with strangers. She was afraid to go on a train. She was just afraid of so many things. The third part of her assignment that the professor gave was to take 100 days and for 100 days to work on something that would help you accomplish your goal that you wanted to accomplish in two years. For her, is a no-brainer. She decided to take 100 of those fears that she had. She chose 100 of them, and every day to do the thing she was afraid to do. And then she made video of it. And it, I would show it, but YouTube would not like that because I hadn't got permission. But it's a great video. You can go out and look at it. Um, but in the video, she shows the different days. And like one of the things she was afraid of was spiders. And she had this one experience where he had a big tarantula crawling on her arm. Okay, and she went one by one. She was afraid of heights. She went on a roller coaster. She was afraid of street food, (laughs) and so she ate street. She was afraid of sharks, and so she went scuba diving with sharks. 
She was afraid of skydiving. She jumped out of a plane. She was afraid of teaching a Zumba class. She taught a Zumba class. She was afraid of surfing. She was afraid of confrontation. She was afraid of donated blood. One day she donated blood. She was afraid of bees. She went in a bee suit somewhere. She was afraid of cats. She held a cat. She was afraid of walking in high heels, and she did that for a whole day. Uh, that's not something I want to try. She was afraid of spicy food, so she had all the spicy food. She was afraid of karaoke, holding a snake, traveling by herself. And all these 100 fears, as she came to the end of it, she realized she could categorize them in seven different categories. It wasn't really 100 different fears. It were, these were the main fears that she had. She was afraid of pain. That's why donating blood, she wasn't afraid of needles. She was afraid of pain. She was afraid of danger. She was afraid of disgust. She was afraid of embarrassment, rejection, loneliness, and control. And so as she was looking at her own life, what caused her to be so afraid, she, uh, she, she really knew what it was. You see, her family were Jewish, and they were World War II survivors. And half of her family was killed in concentration camps. Isn't that awful? And her grandparents were lucky ones, and they survived, and they were able to escape and start a new life, but they still had a lot of fears, because probably those fears kept them alive in some way. But they passed on those fears that they carried from that terrible experience to their children, Michelle's mother, and then to Michelle. And so she was raised also in a kind of a dangerous area to live, and so her early life was, was characterized by fear. And there may be some of us today that have that. Maybe you're afraid of things. Maybe you should be afraid and you're not. Uh, I want to look today at what the Bible says about fear and risk, and uh, we'll, see, we'll see what we have. Let's, let's begin with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are not a God of fear, um, and I pray that you would strengthen our faith today. Help us to look into your word and grow from the experience. Thank you for your Holy Spirit's presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to begin by looking at uh, an account that happens in the book of Acts with a guy named Peter. Now, to give you a little background, um, the book of Luke and the book of Acts are two halves of the same book. They're originally together, and one tells the story of Jesus' life and then his crucifixion and resurrection, and the other tells the story of what happened after that when the early church was beginning. If it was a net, put together in a Netflix show, epi season one would be Luke, and season two would be Acts. And we're picking it up in season two. But before we do this, I want to remind you what happened in the last act of last episode of season one. In the last episode, uh, Peter was running away from Jesus because Jesus had been arrested and it was night, it was scary, and a lot of danger was out there. And so Peter denied knowing Jesus. In fact, there was a, a girl that accused him of being one of Jesus' disciples, and he denied it three times. The last time he cussed and denied it. And so he, he, at the end of the first season, Peter is shown as a very fearful, uh, timid person who kind of ran away when he shouldn't have. Now, season two. Season two, in episode two, we have uh, this story in the book of Acts. Acts three, beginning in verse one. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. This is something that people did, the Jewish people did. And a man who was lame from birth, this is uh, something he had from the day he was born, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. There was a gate, think of it like a, um, a palace or a, a castle, a gate that large, and the Beautiful Gate uh, had bronze and gold on it. It was a very beautiful uh, gate, <laughs> self-evident. And he begged this place because it was a great place to beg. And every day he went to beg from those go, to go or going into the temple. And this day he saw Peter and, Jay, Jay, and John about to enter, and he, he asked them for money. 
And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And this is the same Peter that was timid before him, but he's changed. And Peter said to the man, look at us. And so the man gave them his attention, expected to get something from them, from them, you know, some money or something. And Peter said, silver or gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the hand, the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. And the story goes on that he jumps up and down and rejoices person who never walked before. And after this happened, there was a crowd that gathered. And in verse 12, when Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? And so uh, there's a crowd that gathers, and Peter goes on and gives this big sermon to these people, which is a very dangerous thing to do. Because people still had this, the leaders were still an, had animosity towards Jesus and the followers of Jesus. So it's very dangerous to say you were a follower of Jesus. Jesus had been crucified. And in fact, in chapter 4, verse 1, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And while they were speaking, by the way, this, this, this guy who'd just been uh, healed was holding on to to Peter. And so it was a very powerful illustration that you healed somebody and then you're talking with this person right next to you. And, uh, but the leaders, the religious leaders, were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And then they seized Peter and John because it was evening and they put them in jail into the next day. And so we had Peter who at the end of season one was very fearful of even being known as a follower of Jesus, to becoming this very bold person that when they came against, you know, when he had an opportunity to tell people about Jesus, he did, even such that they put him in jail. And so I want to talk about how this change came about and how perhaps in your life and my life, when we face fearful situations, we can react in the right appropriate way. You know, the word risk um, is a word that just came about in the 1600s. It's a relatively new word. Uh, before this time, people just believed in fate. A lot of people did. They believed that whatever was going to happen was going to happen, and so you just kind of went along with it. Uh, that's just the way the world was. In fact, there was a group of people called um, Stoics, and they believed that uh, everything was determined. And in the Bible, it does talk about how God has a plan for everything. But the Bible looks at it different than we're just all at the mercy of fate. It looks at it that we have a, a, a part in it. Now, if you was to ask somebody today, what it means to have risk. What is risk? Uh, if you ask somebody who de dealt with finances, maybe David Chin, he used to deal with finance. He just retired. But he might give you an answer like this. Risk is the percentage chance that the return on investment will be lower than expected. That's risk. The risk is when you, uh, you invest in something that you're not sure it's going to come out well. And in our lives, there are times when we make decisions um, and we, we don't know for sure what the answer is going to be. And sometimes we're so afraid of making decisions that we're held back by this. Now, in the, uh, for hundreds of years, there was a strong belief uh, in, through faith that people had that God was in control of everything and that gave them comfort. And then in the 1600s, there arose an idea called deism. In fact, some of the founders of our country were deists. What is deism? Well, the idea of deism is that God is remote. You think of uh, the, the famous illustration for this is that God is the great clockmaker. And God made the world 
like a huge complex clock. And then once he made it, it just basically runs. And the, the laws of nature and everything works together, and God is real, but he is remote, which is completely different than what the Bible teaches. But a lot of people believe this, and uh, it became this, uh, f- this feeling of you can do it, you can make changes, and that you are in charge. And um, so if that's the case, you have to be very careful because if you risk and make a bad choice, since God is remote, anything could happen. And so if you have no fear of failure, you'll take too big risk. Or uh, if you have a hypersensitivity to failure, you'll never take any risk. And that can be a problem too. There's a, there's a study that did of uh, young boys And this group of young boys were very nervous and very afraid of ever taking risk. And they had them shoot some basketball. They put put them on a basketball court. And they gave them basketballs and they said, take shots. And one of the things they noticed, that all of them would either do one of two things. Either they would take a layup, make a layup, or they'd shoot from half court. Why? Layups are pretty easy to make. No risk involved much. Well, for some people. And the second is, if you're shooting from half court and you miss it, nobody says, oh, you're not any good, because that's really hard to do. And so they would not, they would take too few risks and never get better at something. And this idea of fear fear of failure is just so real today. And they've written a lot about that um, in different venues. Uh, There is, I looked at one website that was talking about how you get over a fear of risk. And here, here's some of the teaching that they had. They said, first, dwell on your past successes and stop thinking about your failures. Dwell on your past successes and stop thinking about your failures. Frankly, I think that's pretty stupid. <laughs> I mean, failures tell you what you're good at and what you're bad at. So you shouldn't um, ignore your failures. You should, you know, be aware of them. Secondly, it said, just do something risky to prove yourself that you can do it, to get through your fear. Well, that doesn't make much sense to me either, because what if you did something risky and then you hurt yourself for life? I mean, just to prove you can do it. That doesn't make sense. And then it said, if you do fail, remember that there is no such thing as failure, just feedback. We are learners. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of positive, but when you think about it, that, it's so shallow. I mean, there are some times when you make mistakes and it costs a lot. I mean, I was watching the series, Down, Downton Abbey, and in the series, the Lord of the Manor, I forgot his name. Anyway, the Lord of the Manor uh, spends all of the family's money, all their wealth on railroads in America, and they lose the whole estate. Now, he could have gone to this website and told his family, well, remember this is not failure, this is just feedback. But that wouldn't have helped at all. You know, the problem with modern approaches to risk is that they say it all comes from a lack of self-esteem, and that you just don't have enough healthy self-esteem. And that's not really what it's about, I think. The biblical view of this, of fear, is much deeper than that, and it's much more nuanced than that. And so I want to look at two uh, ideas from the Bible that I think are very helpful. One comes from Psalm 3 and one from James 4. Okay, so the first one, and I think this principle comes from Psalm 3, is that if you want to be a person who is better at making choices and facing the things in your life that, um, that are risky, relocate your identity in God's glory. Don't think that it's, oh, because I'm having a lack of self-esteem. No, re-look at yourself as who you are and who God is. Um, In Psalm 3, I want to look at Psalm 3, which is written by King David when he was going through a tough time in his life. And he writes in Psalm 3, verse 1, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. So uh, 
David is facing many, maybe thousands of people that are attacking him physically, and then psychologically people are speaking against me, maybe even his own people. They're saying of him, God will not deliver him. So he's going through a really tough, fearful situation, and his response is in verse 3. He says, but you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high, And so he is not overcoming risk and fear because of his own self-esteem. He understands that it is God that gives him strength, who lifts his head high. And when you go through a trying situation or are faced with something that might be scary to you, sometimes it might be real, uh, like really dangerous, climbing a cliff without a rope. Sometimes it might be holding a cat, which is not really dangerous most of the time, but to, to look to God as the one who holds your head up high, it gives you the strengths. And then uh, David said, I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. And so it's this beautiful image that uh, we get from David on if we want to be people who take in stride fears in front of us, that we should uh, relocate our identity, not in our own ability, but in God's glory. That's what the Bible teaches. Second thing I think the Bible teaches, uh, it's a basic principle. The principle is humble yourself and trust in God's providence providence, that God will take care of you and humble yourself. You don't trust in yourself, but you trust in God's providence. Now, there's this verse that talks specifically about this. It would be very relevant even to the people in business today. It's James 4, verse 13. Now, listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, we'll spend a year there and carry business and on business and make money, why do you know, why do you not even know what will happen, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. And so there's this, this tremendous idea in this verse about how we should trust the Lord. There's two major mistakes you can make in in facing a risk. One is to overestimate the amount of knowledge that you have about the future. I mean, you don't even know what's going to happen. Today, uh, we've had two weekends in a row in Williamsburg in which we had snow. How often does that happen on a Saturday? I mean, it's pretty rare. If you had to take the percentage of it, it happened two weeks in a row, and this snow was actually, I think, more than the last snow, and you just don't know about the future. I mean, if somebody might say to you, well, it's one chance in 100 that happened. Maybe so, but if you're that 100th person, it's a 100% chance. <laughs> and so, you know, don't think that you know exactly what's going to happen in the future. You do not. Uh, second danger of mistakes is that think that you, you can control everything. You know? You can't control everything. You, you can make plans, you know? You can make plans on how you want to do this and that. There was a book uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote called Outliers. In the book, he talks about how people have become really successful. And yeah, he talks about the thing that everybody would think, that they practice whatever they're trying to do a lot and practice the right way over and over again. But then there are things outside of people's control that proves whether they're successful or not. There's the right timing, the right circumstances, the right culture, the right community. All kinds of stuff have to come together for things to work out. So to think that you can control everything in your life To think that you know exactly what's going to happen in the future, those are myths. 
So if you can let those go and don't let them uh, hobble you, don't let them chain you from doing what you might want to do with your life. So what are three things you can do um, that I want to leave you with as we're coming more towards uh, the end part of this? If you're a Christian, first, humble yourself and realize that you're not in charge of everything. Uh, we just talked about that. And say, Lord, okay, I don't know what's going to happen, but I want to say I'm going to trust you that you're going to give me the strength. Second, though you are in the hands of God, what you do matters. And so, yes, you trust God, but it doesn't mean that you are a fatalist like one of these Stoics. Example, in the book of Acts, at the end of the book of Acts, Paul is on his way to Rome, and he's on a boat as a prisoner with some other prisoners, and they're being watched over by a group of soldiers, and then also in the boat, there's a group of sailors, and there's a terrible storm that comes up, and it, was a, it goes on for days, the storm, and they're in this boat being blown everywhere, and an angel comes to Paul and tells him, you're going to survive, and everybody in the boat is going to survive. And so Paul goes and tells everybody on the boat, he says, I've got a prophecy from God that we're all going to be okay. We're all going to be all right. And so they listen to him. By the way, according to Jewish law in Deuteronomy, if you were a prophet and you told somebody that God told you a prophecy and it doesn't come true, you are to be put to death. So Paul took a risk in telling them the prophecy. But he tells them nobody's going to die. Well, the storm continues for several more days until finally the crew of the boat, they don't believe Paul, and they decided to abandon ship. And so they lower a lifeboat down in the front of the boat and are kind of sneaking off the boat. Paul finds them, and he goes and tells the Roman soldiers, he says, you better stop them, because if you don't stop them as they abandon ship, we're all going to die. Now, why does that make sense? He could have said, well, yeah, yeah, I can go off. We don't know any, need anybody sailing the boat in the middle of a storm, which you really do need, because we believe that God is just in control and we're going to be all right. See, what Paul was looking at here is something that we need to look at. There is an interplay between us trusting the Lord and also doing our part that he's given us to do. You can't just say, okay, just... Trust the Lord, and you don't have to do anything else. No, you trust the Lord. But it's not like the Greeks believed that fate was, that God was like a puppet master, just doing everything, and you had no control. No, we do have choices that we make, and we need to make the best choices we can, understanding that God will go with us and give us the strength to go through these things, but to understand that God is in control in a loving way. Um, there's, there's this image some people have that God is this puppet master that is uh, like, a, like a deist. He doesn't really care about people. He's just controlling them all. That's not true, which I want to bring up. And the third thing I want to bring out is that the one Jesus who is in control died for you. So it's not like this is a God who is, you know, apathetic, standing outside, controlling everything. God went to the cross for you and me. If you turn your life over to Christ, he, he can forgive you or he will forgive you if you confess your sin because he died for you. And so this is a, a, a suffering God who, who does this for us because he loves us. And it gives us great resources to make choices that are uh, wise and bold at the same time. And this is involved with individuals as well as groups. Um, there was a, a wonderful pastor I, I used to know. He's passed on, no, but he, he told, told a story. His name was Fred Craddock about his first church that he had in East Tennessee. And he said, I worked there in the summers while I was in seminary, it was 20 miles from Oak Ridge. 
Oak Ridge had just gotten started. It was a place where atomic energy was uh, coming into uh, its, its um, forte. And uh, in this little town, folks were coming from everywhere. They were hard hat types. They were in tents and trailers and little temporary huts and sometimes lean-tos. And uh, they covered the beautiful hills around our church. And uh, they would hang the wash out on fences, and their little kids would be crying, running through muddy places where all those uh, vehicles were parked. He said, my little church, white frame building, beautiful little church, was right in the middle of it. It was a nice church, wonderful people. And he said, I called the deacon board together, and I said, we need to reach out to these folks who are just moving in this community. They just came here from everywhere. They're very close that's our mission. And the chairman of the deacon said, well, I don't think so. And I said, why? He said, well, they won't fit in here. They're just going to live here temporary anyway. They're in the trailers and all. And I said, well, they might be here temporarily, but they need to hear the gospel. We, they need a church. And he said, no, I don't think so. And so they had this uh, deacon's meeting, lasted a long time. The next, uh, next Sunday, they called a business meeting for the whole church. And the upshot of all this was that they made it, one, some person made a resolution. The resolution was made by one of the relatives of the chairman of the deacons, and it said basically this, members will be admitted to this church from families who own property in the county. It was unanimous, except for the pastor, young kid pastor's vote. Years later, Fred Craddock went back with his wife many years later. And they decided they wanted to stop by and see that church. And everything's changed, you know, the roads were different, and it was hard to find. But they went back the country road and back nestled in the pines. It was still there, that little white church. It was shining, it was beautiful, except now there were cars and trucks that were parked everywhere. And and there was a sign out in front of the church. It said, barbecues, all you can eat. And he said, well, we decided, why don't we go in? And so they went inside, and they still had um, many of the things in the church that they had had when he was there, the old pump organ in the front. Uh, it was beautiful. But they had moved all the wood-hewn pews on the side of the walls and they had put up um, these, these little tables, aluminum leg plastic tables. And there were all kinds of people eating in there. I mean, people of different race, different backgrounds, different nationalities. And Fred looked at his wife and said, well, it's certainly good that this is not a church because these folks wouldn't be welcome. They wouldn't fit in if it was a church. There are risks that we need to take individually as well as a community of faith. We're not always guaranteed that everybody is going to be safe, but you need to be people who have a vision that God is going to give us the strength to go, go through the doors that he opens. Uh, at the end of the story of Peter, I just have to read this part because it's such a tremendous ending. And Acts 4, uh, beginning in verse 4. Uh, remember, Peter had been uh, condemned by these religious leaders, but many who heard the message that he and John preached believed and grew to be about 5,000 because he healed this man and told him about Jesus. And then the next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, and John Alexander, and others of the high priest family. And they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power, what name did you do this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, by whom God raised from the dead, 
that this man stands before you healed. And Jesus is the stone, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under which uh, in heaven to be given to mankind which must be saved. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took notes that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could not see the man who had been healed uh, standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Since they could see the man standing there, nothing could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. And they asked among themselves, what are we going to do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they performed a notable sign. And how We can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further uh, among the people, we must warn them to, not to speak no longer in his name. And so they called Peter and John together, and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John said, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is an inspiring story. It should give us strength when we're facing risky situations that with God, through his power, we can prevail. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this beautiful day, and I hope that you keep us all very safe and warm and healthy because a lot of our fam church family is not doing so great right now. And I hope that you give everybody who is sick the strength to get better so we can all come back to church again. And I hope that you give us some snow because that would be great because I love snow. In your name I pray, amen.